We refer to this system as selective endogenous encapsidation for cellular delivery, or SEMS. Uh, what? So hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this video I'm going to break down this recent publication from Feng Sang's lab called Mammalian Retrovirus-like Protein PEG-10 Packages Its Own mRNA and Can Be Pseudotypes for mRNA Delivery. Now that sounds quite complicated, so we're just going to jump into it and talk through it. But effectively, what this paper is describing is a programmable method of RNA delivery between cells, which could have therapeutic applications. So you may or may not know, but one of the major hurdles for RNA technologies for therapeutic usage, such as CRISPR-Cas9, is getting the machinery into the cell and making sure that it's the right cells that you're getting the machinery into without causing any inflammatory response in the body. So you're having safe and targeted delivery of the machinery. Now, as I discussed earlier this year with David Liu, cheeky plug to my interview, there are currently two main approaches for delivering CRISPR machinery or any RNA-based systems into cells. And that is either through the use of adeno-associated viruses or by lipid nanoparticles. And so there are many different variations of both of these at the moment that are thought to have different tissue tropisms. So that means they can target different tissue types. So for example, targeting the liver. And they also have different half-lives and different biodistributions around the body. And so it already gives a variety of different tools to deliver the machinery into the cells. But are there any other mechanisms that might be even more effective or even more selective that we could exploit? Well, this is effectively what Feng Sang and the rest of his lab were trying to investigate in this paper. And so I'd encourage you to read the paper if you're interested in exactly what it is they were doing. But for the sake of not overcomplicating this video too much, I'll try and work backwards and explain what they created and the components that make up the system that they do refer to as SEND. And so one of the things that need to get into the cells for these different gene editing mechanisms to work is RNA. RNA encoding the Cas9 protein or, or RNA guiding the Cas9 machinery to its targeted gene sites. And so one thing that's really good at getting RNA into cells is retroviruses. And so retroviruses use RNA as their genetic material. And when they infect a cell, it makes a DNA copy of its RNA using a so-called retrotransposon, a bit TMI. But anyway, that DNA then can get inserted into the host cell. And then within the host cell, that DNA can be transcribed back to RNA, encoding the genome of the virus. But that RNA also contains the coding sequences for the protein components that make up the virus. And so it enables it to get packaged within the cell, leave the cell, and then to bind to other cell types and to spread, and then integrate into neighbouring cells' DNA as well. And so it turns out that more than 8% of our genome contains so-called retro elements that include retroviruses. And these have integrated into our genomes for our evolution. And so most of these retro elements have now lost their original functions, but they still possess some of the coding sequences for the proteins that enable parts of this retroviral transfer to occur. And so one of these retro elements encodes the protein known as PEG10, and PEG10 has been shown to bind to its own RNA sequence and form capsids. Capsids being the fancy name given to viral particles. And so what they describe in this paper is how they can use PEG10 and alter it such that they could tailor it for different RNA and validate that it can be used as a way to transfer RNA from one cell to another. So this now brings us on to SEND and the components that make it up. And probably the easiest way to try and explain it is with this figure here, where you can see that there are three key components that make up a tailored send. And so the first thing that's needed is PEG10. And so this is the protein I've just been telling you about that forms the viral-like capsid particles and also recognises RNA. And so this is referred to as the cargo RNA because it's going to be carried in the PEG10 capsid. And so because it was known PEG10 binds to its own RNA, they took flanking regions of the PEG10 RNA. So it was actually regions of the 5' prime untranslated region and the 3' prime untranslated region. And those segments of RNA can be added to an RNA of choice, which they show in this paper works for RNA encoding M-cherry a fluorophore 
create a protein and of interest Cas9 and so that makes up your cargo RNA. It's your RNA of interest with regions of the PEG10 RNA such that the PEG10 protein can bind to the cargo RNA. And then the last thing that's needed is a so-called fusogen which is required for cell entry because PEG10 alone isn't sufficient to get the whole system to work. You need to have this last system that binds on the outside of the capsid to recognise targeted cells. And so it's the fusogen that also provides an element of selectivity for targeted cell types. And so the three components together make up SEND. And so the idea is that it's a modular system because you can swap out the cargo RNA for a different RNA of choice. And so, so far, as described in this publication, they've used SEND to deliver the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing system to mouse and human cells to edit targeted genes. And so this is all at the in vitro stage at the moment, just working with cell types. But according to this MIT article, Sang describes, we're excited to keep pushing this approach forward. The realization that we can use PEG10 and most likely other proteins to engineer a delivery pathway in the human body to package and deliver new RNA and other potential therapies is a really powerful concept. And so their next stages of work are going to be focusing on trying to deliver the cargo to a variety of different tissues and cell types, and to also test it in animals, so doing it in vivo. And so this is very early stage work, but it expands the toolbox of ways to deliver gene and editing therapies to cells. And so obviously, without having the in vivo data, it's hard to know at the moment if it has any impact on causing any autoimmune responses or any inflammatory responses within the body. But it's a neat little bit of technology, so I thought I'd share with you my understanding of it today so yeah with that i hope you've learned something in this video and thank you to my patreon supporters and thank you for listening